Meet the man who killed Pluto. Caltech astronomer Mike Brown set in motion a chain of events that reduced the long-established number of planets in our solar system from nine to just eight. Yet he feels no remorse. There was no way that Pluto could survive its status as the single lonely ice ball, but it was, it was going to fall, and it certainly fell. Among our planets, Pluto was long considered to be a bit different. Much smaller than the rest, it has the largest moon in proportion to its own size. It also has the most inclined and eccentric orbit. Its orbit is sort of shaped like an egg. Pluto's orbit causes it to get significantly closer to the sun and then further away from the sun. This cosmic needle in a haystack eluded planet hunters for decades. The eighth planet, Neptune, had been discovered in 1846 and astronomers at the turn of the century were convinced there was a ninth planet in the far reaches of our solar system. The search for Pluto was started by Percival Lowell at Lowell Observatory. He thought there was a planet X there that was perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Before finding the elusive planet, Lowell passed away. But the observatory's research assistant, Clyde Tombaugh, continued his quest. In 1930, at the age of 24, Tombaugh captured an image of an object that seemed to validate Lowell's predictions. The discovery was announced to the world and the object was given an official name, Pluto. But was Pluto Planet X? Some scientists argued that Pluto was far too small and didn't have enough mass to significantly perturb the orbits of its neighboring gas giants, Uranus and Neptune. Astronomers have since realized that there is no such Planet X. It had been predicted using inaccurate estimates of Neptune's mass. Even though Pluto wasn't Planet X, could it still be classified as a planet? Of course, when we realize that uh, the Earth is actually going around the Sun, and that the Moon is going around the Earth, the, the definition of planet changed again. The Earth became a planet, the Sun and the Moon were taken away, and there were finally six. And over time, uh, Uranus was discovered, Neptune was discovered, so there were, there were seven, there were eight, Although it later proved to be smaller than our moon, Pluto was originally thought to be as large as Mars. So Tombaugh's discovery was anointed as planet number nine. No one really thought much else about it, but it was a strange object. It was sort of this lonely outball at the edge of the solar system, but nothing else to call it, so it was called a planet. Because of its great distance from the sun, Pluto takes its name from the Roman god of the underworld. At its closest, Pluto is 2.7 billion miles from Earth. Its diameter is 1,485 miles, half the width of the United States. It takes 248 Earth years for Pluto to orbit the Sun. And a day on the planet is equivalent to about six and a half Earth days. A 150-pound Earthling would weigh only 10 pounds on Pluto. It's a testament to modern technology that we know anything at all about the surface of Pluto. Even from afar, scientists can measure the composition of the planet. They believe that the bright areas of the surface are made up of three types of ice. One is carbon monoxide, one is methane, which is the same as natural gas, and then the third is nitrogen, the same stuff that we have breathing here in our atmosphere. 
The dark areas are probably solid rock. The darker areas are almost certainly silicates of some sort. Silicates not unlike the rocks that we see here. That means there's silicon in them and there's oxygen in them. We're up here in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. There's some snow around, there's some rocks around. This is similar to what we see, what we're going to see on the surface of Pluto. A traveler to Pluto would find that despite the snowy surface, it is a very dim place. It's about 30 or 40 times further away from the sun than the Earth is. This means that the sunlight hitting the surface of Pluto is about 1,000 times fainter than it is on Earth. It's maybe about the same brightness as being outside under a dim streetlight at night. You could probably, you know, take a book. You could probably read it there. Take a headlamp, though. Take a flashlight. It'd help out. Its distance from the sun also makes Pluto one of the coldest places in the solar system, with a bone-chilling average temperature of minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of its small size and low density, gravity on Pluto's surface is far weaker than on Earth. Now some things are going to be a little easier to do on Pluto. If you're really into rock climbing, we're doing some vertical climbing here. And while it's always exciting, gravity is always the challenge. Pluto's gravity is roughly one-fifteenth of the Earth's. It's not like if you're standing on the surface, you would float away. Now, if you fell off that face when you were climbing up Pluto, you'd still want to have your rope there. You'd still accelerate down to the surface. So don't leave the rope at home. Scientists would love to chip away at the surface of Pluto because hidden within its rocks is a whole missing chapter in the history of our solar system. Pluto is a great planet. I mean, it's what I think is really great about it. It's sort of the ultimate time machine in our solar system. It really shows us what the environment of the solar system was like four and a half billion years ago when it was formed. The surface there, it's much more ancient than you're going to find almost anywhere else in the solar system. And if you're looking for rock on the Earth, the Earth has been around for that same time period, four and a half billion years or so. But if you're looking for rock that's that old on Earth, you're not going to find it. That's because the Earth is sort of constantly recycling its material. We have plate tectonics going on that sucks all this material back into the mantle. We have volcanism going on that pumps out new material and processes the surface. So it's really a much younger surface on the Earth compared with the ancient surface that we're going to see on Pluto. The rocks that we're sitting on here have been processed by the high pressures in the Earth. On Pluto, it's more primitive. Primitive, but far from pristine. Pluto is likely riddled with impact craters. Impact craters are caused by asteroids or meteoroids impacting the surface. These are essentially pieces of the solar system that were never made into planets. On the outer surface of Pluto, you don't have an atmosphere, you don't have glaciers, you don't have wind, you don't have rain, you don't have erosion. The one dominant feature that you see on the surface is probably going to be a lot of impact craters. Pluto's pockmarked surface undergoes a transformation as it orbits near the sun. Under the additional heat, some of the frozen gases evaporate to form a temporary atmosphere. As Pluto recedes from the sun, the gases freeze again and fall back down to the surface. For more than 75 years, this far out icy object staked its claim as our ninth planet. So why is this little piece of snowy rock now causing such controversy? Why was Pluto kicked out of the solar system's most exclusive club? It's a quiet office at the Caltech campus in Pasadena, California. And it was from here that Pluto's demise as a planet began. But astronomer Mike Brown was never looking to destroy a planet. 
Equipped with Palomar Observatory's 48-inch telescope, he was seeking out Pluto-sized worlds at the far reaches of our solar system. And in 2005, he found one, an object bigger than Pluto with its own moon, both orbiting the sun. When I first found this thing that's bigger than Pluto, I was looking through the images that the telescope had taken um, just before, and I found it in the screen. And the very quick calculation realized it was bigger than Pluto. Um, and the very first thing I did was picked up the phone and called my wife and told her I just found a planet. Indeed, if Pluto was a planet, and for more than 70 years it had been, then why wouldn't Brown's new world be considered a planet too? I thought it was the 10th planet. I, uh, for a long time, that's how I described it. It was a planet, and so I definitely felt like I had found the 10th planet. It's 5% bigger than Pluto. It's probably made out of the same materials on the inside, rock on the inside, ice on the outside, and a little thin layer of frost on the very outside that sometimes puffs up into an atmosphere and sometimes doesn't. Very similar to Pluto in that way. It has a moon that goes around it once every uh, 16, 17 days. Pluto has a moon also, so it's, in many ways I like, I like to think of it as, as almost as twins. This is just the twin that just ate a little bit more when it was a baby, got a little bigger. Brown considered naming his object Xena after TV's warrior princess, but eventually the name chosen was Eris, after the Greek goddess of discord. As it turned out, this name was entirely appropriate. The discovery kicked off a firestorm in the astronomical community. Now, the very definition of a planet was being hotly debated. Would Eris officially become our 10th planet? Or would Pluto-sized objects be re-evaluated as a whole? The argument was brought to the table in a 2006 meeting of the International Astronomical Union in Prague. A vote was taken, and the term planet was defined scientifically for the first time. Instead, scientists say the issue was addressed because they learned about Eris and other large Kuiper Belt objects. The Kuiper Belt is a 3.5 billion mile wide region in the outer solar system near Pluto. It's home to hundreds of thousands of icy objects, the first of which was discovered in 1992. So historically, we've thought of the outer solar system where you've got Uranus and Neptune out there. You've got there these big gaseous planets, giant planets. And then just beyond that, you've got this little straggler, Pluto, that doesn't really fit into the picture. Well, now when we found all these other Kuiper Belt objects, what we're seeing is that maybe Pluto is really the, just the first of these many, many bodies of the Kuiper Belt that are uh, this wide diversity of, of icy, small icy bodies at the outer solar system. The result of the IAU vote stipulated that a planet is a spherical object that orbits the sun and clears out the neighborhood around its orbital path. Since the area around Pluto is full of other Kuiper Belt objects, the new definition would leave Clyde Tombaugh's great icy discovery out in the cold. Pluto's 76-year reign as the ninth planet was over our solar system would now officially consist of only eight planets. Objects like Pluto and Eris were given the new classification dwarf planets. Dwarf planets possess the same characteristics as planets, but do not have a clear orbital path. Under the new definition, Ceres, the largest asteroid in our solar system, is also a dwarf planet. The IAU vote was meant to settle the debate on what constitutes a planet, but many scientists refused to accept the outcome. 
there are astronomers who want it to be a planet still, and they just keep ripping those scabs off whenever possible, and uh, they they want to they want to keep it fresh. I believe Pluto is a planet, <laughs> and I don't think the question of whether or not Pluto is a planet is really that important. Fundamentally, it's not a scientific question; it's a question of names. But in a way, in an odd way, it's become one of the highly visible subjects of planetary science. People always ask whether Pluto is a planet or not. There's not one easy dividing line. There's one not where where uh, we move from being a planet over here, being a planet over here, to being not a planet over here. Just like there's no real dividing line between a stone and a pebble. It's really more of a sociological question. It's a question of definitions of words rather than a question of science. Although no longer officially a planet, scientific interest in Pluto hasn't waned. Even as the vote was being taken in Prague, a NASA spacecraft called New Horizons was already on its way to explore this far-off world. The New Horizons mission will be the first spacecraft ever to visit Pluto. By going to Pluto, studying Pluto, we, we, it's no longer a mission to a singular object, but it's, but it's actually a mission to one of a class of objects that we'll get to learn about. But New Horizons needs to travel at warp speed, or a valuable research opportunity to study Pluto's atmosphere will be lost for at least the next 200 years. The New Horizons spacecraft is headed for a rendezvous with Pluto. We have confirmation of spacecraft separation. But scientists are trying to beat the clock. Because as Pluto recedes from the sun, its 62-year-long winter is coming. And when winter comes to Pluto, the dwarf planet's atmosphere will freeze and fall to the ground. To get there in time, New Horizons is blazing through the solar system at more than 45,000 miles an hour. That's 12 miles a second. At that speed, a trip from Los Angeles to New York would take about three and a half minutes. So this is the fastest spacecraft that was ever launched from the Earth. In fact, it took about six hours to get out to the quarter million miles to make it out to the moon. Uh, you can compare that to the couple of days that it took the uh, Apollo astronauts to get out that, that same distance. Pluto is just a big mystery. It's exciting to me that there's a spacecraft on its way there and that in a few years we'll, you know, this sort of blank slate of a world will be richly filled in with, with pictures and detailed data.